it was not a traditional documentary. This was not really a story of the life of James Baldwin. The director, Raoul Peck, decided to use an interesting frame. He found, as you saw, this manuscript that was never published. Uh, James Baldwin never completed it. He only had 30 pages to work with. And he said that he didn't want, um, I'd actually interviewed Raoul Peck, so I, I, I got a little bit of the backstory, and he said he did not want to have a lot of talking heads deconstructing James Baldwin's life. That instead, he wanted James Baldwin to speak for himself, and so you had Samuel Jackson doing the voiceover, in case you didn't recognize that voice, that was Sam Jackson. Um, and that he wanted to use as much archival footage of James Baldwin and then his thoughts on his three friends who, who left too soon. So I'd just like to hear from um, both of you about what you thought of this construction and if you really captured James, and if it really captured James Baldwin the man. Judy, I want to begin with you. Yeah. Um I mean, part of it is I'm, I'm looking at it as, a, as a filmmaker. You know, I'm, I've done a number of documentary films. You know, the 14 Hours of Eyes on the Prize, and then for American Experience, um, Malcolm X Make It Plain, and a lot of things. But I always use um, e within the broadcast, certainly um, films, the traditional format. You know, you have um, the Talking Heads. Um, try not to use scholars, but yeah, you use scholars, you do all of that. But in some ways, it takes away from the person, him or herself. What you see here to me is just an incredible um, revelation of who Baldwin was. And when you see that archival footage, I mean, I lived during that time, and you see him and the power that he had um, and that he could give tit for tat. I mean, the boy was brilliant. You know, I mean, the man was brilliant. He really... And so what you got was that incredible intelligence, and it leaps up off the, the archival. And you don't get any separation between him and you, the audience, because there's nobody trying to interpret him for you. You know, you're seeing it. And, and to me, I guess for me, I'm also thinking about, as a filmmaker, to go through, I mean, I know that Raul Peck took 10 years to do this. And the amazing amount of archival footage and writings that he had to go through to do this is absolutely, I mean, it would be overwhelming for me to take on the tasks that Raul Peck had done. He said it was, a, it, it, it was something that got on top of him. Yes. It really was a passion project. So for you, removing the talking heads created a kind of intimacy. You felt like yes, you were much closer to James Baldwin. Ashley? Absolutely, I think that there is a, too many times we ask for people to interpret what we see. And we watch certain cable news channels that reflect the ideologies and things we, uh, personal bent on life we see. But I think for many people here, probably this was their first time seeing James Baldwin speak. Uh, they may have read The Fire Next Time and other things. And so you watch this and you see this from your own personal perspective. You're going to digest this right now in your mind. If you're old enough to remember that era, it was a reflection of the America you knew. If you are not old enough, you look at this and you see the America you know now and are probably somewhat surprised about the resemblance of 40 to 50 years ago. And I think in that uh, perspective, as, as husbands and wives talk after this film with their children, and hopefully you share their story, that you'll understand the continuum of the struggle of the uh, American Negro and now the African American, and we have so many names we've, we've gone through. But I think that when you understand that continuum, um, each generation will understand their place and their role and their duty as it was talked about in this film. Judy, I want you to help us understand something because when you see James Baldwin um, do this, tr this, really this takedown of Professor Rice where he kind of squares his shoulders and then just reads him up one side and down the other. We see that now in the context where we're used to seeing people sparring on television and when they do engage in that kind of intellectual sparring. We're used to seeing people of color doing that. Um, this would have happened at a time uh, where Dick Cabot opened his, his studio and his chair to many people of color, and that was unusual at the time. How was, how was James Baldwin seen at that time, particularly you know, in, in the sense that he was edgy, he was intellectual, he did get in people's faces, and he did things that, that people really didn't do at that time? Well, there are two things to, I, I would say about that. One is um, the anger that he expresses. I mean, we use, there's a piece of that footage that we used in our American experience, Malcolm X Make It Plain. And it's where he's um, talking about um, Malcolm explains the black person's reality. 
And it was, it was absolutely perfect. And so when he's talking about that black person's reality, it is so real um, that any black person looking at him would think, whoa, you know, go ahead. I can't, I don't remember but, but how many unusual black leaders it was. at hmm? the time were not displaying anger because no. that was an emotion that which was not available Which is why Malcolm had, that's exactly right, which is why Malcolm had, um, sp spoke for so many of us, I think, at that time. But when you looked at, at um, Baldwin with the Cavett show, you would, I don't know that there was any other time I would have seen something like that on a talk show or on anything. I mean, first of all, you didn't see black people on television. I mean, you know, this was, this was the 60s. You didn't, you didn't see a whole lot of black folks. So, um, I mean, television then was like Hallmark Channel movies now. You know, you don't see any black people in Hallmark Channel movies. Um, and so that's what the whole of television was like at that point. So to see a black man also dressing down a white scholar at that point was just, you know, was just amazing. Um, and, and no, you wouldn't have seen that with most people. And you wouldn't have seen that with any of the other leaders as well. Except, well, Stokely would have done that, but that's a whole other thing. And, and you could see the discomfort on Dick Cavett's face. Absolutely. I think that um, every African-American adult and some of our children have been in that moment. And he was saying things that probably wish we could have said, but we're talking to a teacher or a boss or someone else in our life that may not understand our perspective or our frustrations. So I think that in that moment, uh, James Baldwin was, was speaking uh, in a way that uh, reflected a lot of the way people felt, but it, it more so um, spoke to him taking advantage of an opportunity. And that's an opportunity that unfortunately many of us miss. And I think every one of us can think back at that time that you had a chance to say something but you missed that opportunity. You had a chance to, to express your perspective, to help people understand and enlighten them about the plight of, of, of people of color, and you may have missed it. But that moment, we saw that opportunity being taken, and I hope uh, that going forward that you'll see more people take that opportunity to express that perspective as well. Many of the people in the room today have been engaged in a civil rights symposium, and we have been thinking about and, and wrestling with some really big questions. And James Baldwin held up a mirror to American society and he asked very difficult questions. And one of the questions he asked, and forgive me for the language, but you just saw it in the film, he said, I is, I'm a man, I'm not a nigger. But America has decided that they want to affix that label on my shoulder. And that's what he said. And so he said, America has to decide why that was important. Why did America need someone to take on that subjugated role? in this country? Why did America need that? And when he says America, he's principally talking about white America. And I guess when I saw that, it reminded me of there's a piece of footage that we used in, in uh, the first series of Eyes on the Prize. And you see uh, um, you know, a, a white Southern racist, as opposed to a white Northern racist, but a white Southern racist who says, um, uh, the interviewer asks him a question, and he says, well, look, if I'm not better than a nigger, who am I better than? And this is a poor white guy, you know, many of whom I'm sure voted for Trump, you know. I mean, the sense is that you've got to be better than somebody. And we have always been that somebody you're better than. If you're in a room with all kinds of nationalities, except if you got a Native American, you can generally feel that you're probably better than that one person. We have always been the one that everybody kind of jumped on. Um, and yeah, I, I agree that that's exactly what has happened, that he is, he is expressing what I think a lot of us believe, yeah. No, I think at the moment um, where he says that uh, at five, six, or seven, if you're African American, you realize you're, you're black, and it's not because you look in America, someone in society lets you know that you're black, and whether it's that scene in Imitation of Life. And I think for many, <coughs> many people of color, and I grew up in the Deep South, and I spent most of my life in the Deep South, you know, it was around middle school when you realize that there's a difference. And as children, play innocently. They don't pick up on these things until their parents are at some point instill in them. So I don't, I think it, it highlights the point that people aren't born racist. Um, people are accustomed and they're, they download their environment. And that significant moment in the history of every African American can tell you the moment they realized that they were different and society looked at them differently and that there was a pecking order that they were expected to understand and they were expected to follow. And then the rest of your life is figuring out how you defy that pecking order and how you rebel against it. 
James Baldwin um, asked another question. He talked about his, in, in, his, in writing to, um, to his, his agent, he noted that he felt a, a little bit of guilt living and watching the struggles from afar in Paris, that he wasn't raising money, he wasn't coordinating people, he lived, um, it, it, he didn't have to live in, in real and actual fear after he left Harlem and settled in Paris. And he said he wasn't paying his dues. And it, it makes us think of this question now, how do we pay our dues? As, as a generation, um, someone who fought for civil rights, someone who's from the generation, I guess it would include both of us, who are trust fund babies from the civil rights movement um, and wondering how much is left in that bank you know, right now. How does one play, pay their dues today? Well, I mean, I think everybody can do something. You know, I mean, that's the thing. It's sometimes small things, it's sometimes big things. I mean, can I just say one thing that always, that struck me about this is how amazing Raoul Peck was in terms of absolutely butting against each other to contrasting two realities. So you go right from Doris Day to the lynching. Yeah. And that was incredible to me because in a lot of ways, we are living in different realities. My reality is, I, I mean, I realize that when I'm listening to some of the people you know, who voted for Trump, who voted for or even for Hillary. They really are living different realities. For me. They don't have to worry about when I, like when I go in a store, I know, even if I'm dressed to the nines, as we used to say, um, unless that store owner, and it's a little boutique, knows who I were, I'm gonna be followed. In the same way that the president of Brown University um, at that time said, you know, she was followed through Lord and Taylor on Fifth Avenue. There is a different reality for us. And, and so I think, um, I wanted to say that because I think what he captured in that was that contrast absolutely going from one image to the other, one image to the other, contrasting the two. Well, let, but let me I set should, aside. I, I haven't well, answered wait, your, well, yeah. But let me set aside the paying of dues question because you do, bring, as, and you're, as a filmmaker, you would be, you know, of course you would notice that. Um, but he uses Raul Peck as a filmmaker also, and he, he uses cinema to tell the story and to explain how the important role that Hollywood has played mm -hmm. in enforcing this idea of the American dream and who gets to be truly American, capital A, American. Mm -hmm. and, and James Baldwin writes about this in this essay, that that's where he sort of got his ideas when he discovered what it means to be black and looking at these images and realizing, wait a minute, the good, the good guys don't include me. This dream that I see on screen and in these magazine spreads don't include me. You know, I grew up with, with images that were all white. I mean, I never saw any black people. You know, at one point, um, Nat King Cole, um, the wonderful jazz um, musician, was on for a while, uh, but that was that. And then um, Belafonte was on, um, oh gosh, do you remember the, uh, the variety show? Um, and I can't remember her name. But she had a variety show, and at some point, she held his hand. And so they were gonna cut that out, because- Sure? No, oh no. Um, uh, oh, a younger, younger woman, and I can't remember her I'm name. Stumped. Does anybody, anybody know? Anybody else? Carol Burnett. Wasn't Carol Burnett? No, no, because she wasn't. Yeah, um, but that's all right. White person who had a variety show held his hand, um, and they were afraid that the South wouldn't carry it, so they were going to cut it out. And she, um, oh, she was a British. She was a white British um, singer. Who? Yes, thank you, Petula Clark. Okay, so Petula Clark did this. Thank you very much. Um, and, and what happens is that she refuses, and so it plays as it is. My whole image was always white people. So that even when I'm looking at, what is it, um, the one with, oh, Miss Charlotte, I don't know nothing about birth and babies. Um, Butterfly Thank you. McQueen. Okay, yes. Or um, uh, just about every image I got, wh when I'm sitting in, let me, Quick story. This is a quick story. Okay. Well, no, we have, we have oh, a no, lot of It has okay, to be real quick because we okay. want to make sure that we okay, have time oh, sorry. for okay. questions. Um, when we're in Atlanta and Ogingo Odinga from, the, uh, from Kenya and he, he's visiting SNCC, he's visiting Atlanta and this is the first time I've ever seen an African and I expect that he's going to come down. The only thing I've known is Uga Booga. Okay. It is Tarzan. Uga Booga because always what they did is they seemed to, they, um, made Africa a horrible place in order to, because of course that's where we're from. So then you must have no, no civilization, no intelligence, no whatever. So I'm expecting him to come down and maybe, you know, I don't know, a loincloth, who knows, you know. And of course he comes down in these gorgeous robes, he speaks five languages, and we talk about, you know, uh, uh, education. But it was the first time I said, well, if they've lied to me about this, what else have they lied about? 
that's the end of the story. <laughs> so I have seen this film three times with three different audiences. I saw it most recently at the National Museum for African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. I hope all of you make your way to Washington, D.C. to grace its doors. It is an amazing institution. And I saw it in the Oprah Winfrey Theater with a largely African American audience. And it was like church. You all were much quieter. <laughs> but there's a scene in particular from the chain gang where Sidney Poitier and, and, and Tony Curtis are running in, and, and he holds out his hand and Tony Curtis can't make it and you know, and with great dramatic effect that bandage hand lets go. And there's a question, will Sidney ride the train onto ostensibly freedom or will he roll off the train with Sidney? And, and, and James Baldwin notes that in black theaters people are like, stay on the train! Don't get off the train! And in the audience at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, everyone was yelling, stay on the train! <laughs> But there, there's a metaphor in that moment that he speaks to and why, why Sidney jumped off the train. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you interpreted that? You know, I looked at it a little differently, um, primarily because I, I, I saw the, the imagery of um, the struggle. They were chained together, they would struggle, they would fight, but they were still intrinsically connected. And to me, I didn't, I, I didn't see why he jumped off, the, why he would have stayed on the train. <clears throat> and for me, why would he stay on the train? Because wherever he's going, there's going to be another white person there that he's probably going to have to fight. So do you leave and just go to the next place? Um, or do you fight the fight where you are? And I think that, to me, is the life of uh, James Baldwin, to some degree. My first introduction to James Baldwin was me trying to figure out what made him come back. I was in school was studying. Um, I was African American studies major, and I, I had to figure out why he go to France. I get why he left, but what made him come back? It is that fight, uh, knowing that you can't run away from this dilemma that was facing African Americans in this country and still faces us today. You have to fight it where you are with the tools you have, and turning your back on that is the dereliction of duty that you were speaking of when you were talking to. So James Baldwin is, is very personal. Um, if, you've, if you've read James Baldwin, you have a very personal, uh, almost like relationship with him. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering for both of you, what was, what was your, your entry point? There is a James Baldwin quote that is very near to me. Um, you have to decide who you are and, face, and force the world to deal with you, not with its idea of you. Absolutely. And that's something that I have carried with me because, you know, as a brown girl who grew up in Minnesota who had a speech impediment, um, a life behind a microphone was not the world that was imagined, you know, for me. That, that really speaks to me. So I just want to hear from both of you before we hear from the audience. You know, what was, the, what was your portal to James Baldwin? Well, I think his writings, but also um, when we were in Mississippi, he came through. Um, and so he and, of course, Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier. And I think for who are both celebrating birthdays this week. Are they we really? Say, yes, both oh of my them. God, then Harry's going to be 90, right? I think he's going to be 90. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, so for me, I think um, it was the sense also that Baldwin was taking the militant point of view. And as an, as an author, as a person that the white community respected, he could say it in words that they needed to hear, they, they could hear, maybe not understand, but they would at least hear him. And he, he really incorporated that rage that a lot of us felt. I mean, people say, oh, you all, wasn't it wonderful that you all in the civil rights movement, you know, were kumbaya. No, no, a lot of us were really, really mad, okay? And that there is a place for righteous rage unless it makes you dysfunctional. And I think that's what he was always worried about. Is the rage gonna eat me up? But there is a place for that. And so what I appreciated with him was that he could express that rage and do it intelligently and do it articulately in a way that you would hope people would understand him. So yours was J seeing James Baldwin, the man in action. Mm -hmm. And for you, I assume it was, in, in, was being introduced to him on the page. You know, it, it was his biography more so than his right. I was trying to understand his life because uh, my professor was trying to explain to me, much as you saw in the movie, 
This was a man who did not join the organizations you thought he would have to join in order to be effective. He didn't join the NAACP. He chose not to be a church-going person when most of our leaders were coming out of mosques and coming out of churches. But he did begin as a preacher. He did begin as a preacher. preacher. He did begin as a preacher. But his uh, refusal to just accept some of the normal conventions and organizations of which uh, you would typically assume that someone needed to be a part of to affect change. And I think that sort of was my my turning point. It, it began for me in college to where I felt like uh, I would rage against probably every status quo I probably could, which is why you see me as a black Republican on stage, I don't get that. But what happens there is when, you're, when you see people uh, try to put labels on you, because they look at you and they say, you're black, you gotta be this party. You're black, you gotta be a part of this organization. And then you look at the state of our country now, and you see that the current status quo has not produced the results that we want. Black people will always be in a state of raging against the status quo. And in that raging, you have to figure out how do you change the status quo. And that means that you cannot conventionally join and be a part of the same things over and over again and expect to find a different outcome. So for me, it has been looking at James Baldwin's life and seeing that many times he was left out but it was okay, but he still found a way of making a voice and a change in a, in a completely different mold from the other men that you saw him uh, particularly writing about in this particular movie. James Baldwin was a griot, he was an oracle. Um, what you see in his works here, that this was cinema in the pluperfect. He was talking about the past, but it is so relevant in this moment. Uh, but, but he's not celebrated necessarily in the way that you might expect him to be. Um, in, in universities and in museums, he's taught, but it, 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 is, it is somewhat surprising that we don't see him celebrated as a man of letters because of his lasting influence. You know, I, I think that the, the, it was, there was one mention here in the movie about his sexuality, mm -hmm. and I think I'd be remiss to think that there were some people who were afraid of where to place him in history. I know my professor, when she, I was being taught about James Baldwin, brought it up and somewhat talked about his role at the March on Washington, where, where his absence there because of that. And I think that now is probably a, a easier time to have that conversation because there were a lot of conflicting causes. Uh, it, it, when, when people read his work and they say, well, do we want, to, would we want to talk about his sexuality or not? But I think in the movie, you hinted on it, but I think that in the past has probably been, unfortunately, a reason that people didn't kept the distance, kept the distance to some degree. And, and we should explain that Raul Peck actually addressed that. He said that he didn't deal with it frontally. There was the mention in the FBI file, and then there was the uh, mention, he mentions being in Puerto Rico with Lucien, mm -hmm. who was his partner. But he didn't go into it because in the writing in that manuscript, that was the Bible that he used for, mm -hmm. the, um, for the script for this film. And so that's why um, he didn't deal with it frontally. And I gotta say, I, I probably would would um, differ with you in the sense that I don't think the reason he's not you he's not part of the traditional canon is because he was gay. I think it was because he was so clearly angry when he was talking to white people. You know, he really did. Yeah, alienated, but or alienated because he was telling truth to power. I mean, he really was. When he says white is a met metaphor for power. That is not something that most other black writers were saying. And he was saying it in the Atlantic. He was saying it in the traditional white publications. And I think that, you know, white folks really didn't want to hear it. And he said, you know, to, you, can't hold, you can't lynch people and hold them in ghettos without becoming a monster. Yes. Strong language. That's right. Were you as an audience made uncomfortable by some of what you saw? Yes, yes. Yes, well let's talk about that a little bit. Let's bring the audience into this discussion. We have microphones that are moving around the room. If you just raise your hand, let's hear from you right in the back row. Thank you very much. Um, I was just, when you said that when you had seen this um, film with two other audiences and there was much more vibrancy and it was a little silent here, the, the thing that occurred to me is maybe there's some shame in our in the white community about this. And that's when you don't want to talk about that because that's so uncomfortable. And I think we all realize we live in a world that's been created for it that has this ladder and um, where white people are at the top. And uh, Chimamanda Adichie in her book Americana talks about this ladder. But I think, and especially in Aspen because we all, we live in a beautiful place and if you wake up in the morning and see the sunrise, you realize we're in a circle, not a ladder. 
And, but how do we get to that? And where's the leadership to lead that conversation? And I hope the Aspen Institute will continue with this. Thank you, so thank, thank you. you. And you say no one wants to talk about it, but you know, you just did, so good on you. Thank you. Either one of you want to respond to that? Judy, do you want to respond to that? No, I think she's right. Okay, all right. Any Another question? Yes. All right, first thing, the summation that he was telling you was blues for Mr. Charlie. You remember the book? Mm -hmm. All right, now, the second thing is, I really didn't want to be here, but I let other people across the country know, all right, that I would come here, because that film, you can scratch it. At the same time, you wrapping republicanism, I'm a real one. All right, what happened, Martin Luther King was Republican, and a lot of others were. The thing that you're dealing with is that you still haven't learned from the past. And that's all three of you. And I know about Terrytown. I know about Westchester County, because I have a veto up there too, all right? But when you learn from the past, then you're gonna do something different. Here. And do you have a question in there also, or just a comment? My brother, I think a lot of us up here have been in the struggle a long I'm time. I'm talking about the Bill Ooh, beyond me. Okay, there's a question back, back here, and then I'll come over on this side. Thank you for bringing this back. Some of us had seen it before, and the influence of James Baldwin reading Black Like Me at 15, and then has, was life changing. My question to you is, are people from all these different audiences connecting the dots that unless we stand with people not being deported who've lived here for 20 years, um, unless we help the Muslims and the Muslims help the Jews, unless people realize we're all in it together and it's not just the power and the, Ameri the military industrial complex, that it's really the end, it's the death of democracy because we're gonna to fall together, we're gonna to rise together. Are people connecting that dot or do things have to get much worse? Do you think before middle America um, sees what's, what we've put in? What yeah, let me just say, I think um, when, when Trump got elected um, and I realized what he had run on, one of the things I realized was I have really got to get in connection with, um, there's something called, um, Casa Maryland, um, because I figured what's really going to happen is there's going to be some really wholesale kind of um, raids, you know. And I knew that Obama had done raids and he had separated families. I knew all that, but I also knew that this was a campaign promise. Um, and so my thing was, and I think a lot of people are doing this now, they are connecting um, across the usual regions. It's interesting, um, BYP 100, who is, which is one of the group's um, young movement for black lives, because there's a Black Lives Matter, but then there's a kind of larger um umbrella group. And so that would be Trayvon Martin and, and Umi down in um, Jacksonville. It would be Ohio Students Association. It would be uh, BYP 100. And there's a young woman, um, Carruthers, uh, Charlene Carruthers, who was quoted in a New York Times article, because I get the daily, you know, I'm one of the older folk. I like the paper, right? So I get a daily sub to the New York Times. And so I'm looking at this piece, and um, it mentions um, Charlene Carruthers talking about how she has now connected with the Latino population and with the Muslim population. And, with, and, and, and part of it is because in Chicago, what she knows is what happens to them happens to us. Now she's, again, black uh, Movement for Black Lives, larger purse, BYP 100, with, which was Black Youth Project 100. And what's happening is a lot of these folks who were kind of in their own, I hate silos, because that's one of those foundation terms, but who were in their own little areas dealing with their own stuff now because of Trump and realizing we're all at risk, are now connecting across the usual lines, and I'm seeing it all over. It's not just because I'm in Montgomery County, Maryland, no, it's all over the place. And you see it, um, I clipped, oh, well, I, that's a, it's down there somewhere. I clipped this article um, talking about how there were now lots of, oops, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. 
Oh, okay. Um, lots of demonstrations um, in a lot of different locations, and they're talking about more than just my, my little corner of the world or what's happening in the black community or the Latino community or the um, uh, Native American community. There really is a linking, and it's, it's just amazing to me. Wouldn't happen without Trump, I think. Do you have anything to say, Ashley? I'll take the next one. Um, is there a question on the side of the room? Yes. Um, you asked uh, or suggested that uh, much of um, uh, Baldwin's uh, legacy and so forth has not been recognized so much as certainly not as much as we might think it warrants. I think um, one of the points that he was really trying to and that he expressed is that if white people did not have a nigger, they would have to invent it. And the only way for us to solve this original sin, so to speak, is for white people to confront face on this issue. And I think the real problem for all of us is that white people really don't know how to do that, how to confront the issue of not only race, but the creation of nigger. And I think that's really why we don't um, collectively, black and white, confront it. I think we want to, and I think far more people want to confront it and would be willing to now, but just don't know how to. Hey, Ashley, can you talk a little bit about this? Because last night some of us were talking about you know, the comparison with America and South Africa, for instance, and there, it's not a, a clean comparison. But one thing that South Africa did is they held a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And reconciliation was important, but truth-telling was a key part of that also, looking back with very clear eyes at a very difficult history. Ashley, will you talk a little bit about? You know, as always, as a person that's not white, it's always hard <clears throat> to sit and try to figure out what white people should do amongst each other to figure out how this should work out. Um, but, but I will say that, you know, obviously being a person of color, we have to figure it out and survive either way. So whether white people collectively decide that we're going to apologize, it doesn't matter to us. We still got to figure out a way to live, get our kids educated, build schools, have safe communities. We have to continue on. So if you're asking me as a person who's a political who strives every day to better the lives of everyone, and especially African Americans, am I holding my breath? No. But I am hopeful, hopeful that we can continue to have these conversations because I think that as uncomfortable as you were when you watched the movie, I hope that by the time we're done, you're less uncomfortable because you know that there's other people like out you who have the same worries, the same fears for our country. And at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. But there are people that you have to recognize in this country who still fear. And that insecurity in who they are is what re re creates the need for somebody to be that word. And as long as that fear still exists, we will continue to fight it. And whether it's African Americans, whether it's Latinos, whether it's somebody else, the Muslims, it's a revolving carousel. We must find a way in this country for people to deal out of a position of hope instead of fear. As long as you operate from a position of fear, this will always be the outcome that we find ourselves in America. You know, one way to, to perhaps... Um, one way to perhaps think about that also is when we're talking about history, American history, civil rights history, it's often told through a black lens, through the, the, the people who marched, the people um, who wrote about the marches or the movement. But we also have to cast our lens a little bit wider to make sure that the conversations also include white Americans who enjoyed, enforced, or just looked the other way when America was deeply segregated. And that way we will at least get closer to the truth and be able to engage in that kind of truth that would actually lead to reconciliation. Judy. I gotta say, I'm, I'm now beyond talk. I really am. I'm at the point where I'm looking at just some really horrible things going on in this country. And I understand you got to talk because you got to talk strategy and you got to think about who you connect with, who you coalesce with, who are the what are the kind of coalitions you can build. But in this community, for example, I'm, I'm at the Meadows, right? That's a mainly, I mean, I'm looking at a mainly, in terms of the household staff, mainly Latina and Latino. Now, I don't know what they're up against here in Aspen. I'm not in Aspen. I'm in Montgomery County and Silver Spring, right? Maryland. But I do know that at this point, we're gonna have to do something beyond um, talking. 
we're gonna have to do something that leads to real action because we got a whole lot of people we're gonna have to protect. When I heard that Trump had gotten elected, I said, okay, am I gonna have to do what I thought I might have to do when I lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when 9-11 happened? Because people were getting crazy. And I'm on the, on the T, which is the subway, right? And I'm on the T and I see a black woman who sees a man in a, uh, you know, in a turban and says, I think he's one of them. And I'm thinking, what? I said, no, he's not, you know? But she, it didn't matter that I said that. She was still worried. And I thought, I'm gonna have to go to Central Square in Cambridge, and I'm gonna have to go where the mosque is, and I'm gonna have to link arms with whoever's trying to protect the mosque. I think what's gonna have to happen is we are really gonna have to make some hookups, maybe beyond the, uh, you know, beyond the, again, the lines that we usually don't cross, because we're gonna have to do some real serious work. And it's not, see, the, prob the only problem I had with Truth and Reconciliation was that the, the, the relatives of Steve Biko had to sit there and watch while the, the um, South African police who took his body, so, by the way, Steve Biko was this young black man who was just this incredible, wonderful um, freedom fighter in South Africa uh, during the apartheid regime, right? They, they got him and they used his body as a battering ram against the wall. Now, what the parents had to listen to was that he probably, the person, the cop who did this would probably not have to serve any time because he admit, had admitted to this because that was one of the things. If you come forward and tell us about this, you won't have to serve any time. So the problem I have is that at some point, somebody's, it's like Nuremberg, those guys had to serve time. They had to stay behind bars. You don't get to say, I did all these horrible things, but hey, don't worry, because you know I now told you, so I'm gonna be free. Um, so it's both of those things. Truth and reconciliation, I think we need to, people need to know those things that we said were happening, really were happening. We weren't just being paranoid. They really were listening and tapping our lines and stuff. They really was a COINTELPRO, I get that. But I think beyond that, given the times we're living in now, it's gonna, it's gonna mean that we, wherever we are, have to figure out how we reach out and start saying to the people, I got your back. Yeah. One last question right here. Let's address that. <coughs> Ashley, <coughs> you talked about fear. Um, <coughs> the problem we have right now is that the leadership in this country is creating an enormous amount of fear and, <coughs> and it's being manifested through the Muslims and the uh, Mexicans and to some extent even the Jewish community. <coughs> if somebody doesn't step up and stop the leaders from creating this fear, we're never gonna get past this problem. You know, I think that, uh, I, I, I totally understand your point and I, and I think that, you know, I look at this as uh, kind of like what Judy said a little earlier. Um, people campaign and they show their hand and they they govern how they campaign. Like Judy said, she was worried about some campaign promises, so you thought made some decisions. We have a system in this country um, that is that has failed people who are uh, oftentimes marginalized. That's just the bottom line. And there are people who are loyal to political parties who get out and vote. African Americans got out and voted really strong for Democrats and 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 you kind of got to ask yourself, like, what is the return on investment sometimes when we're so loyal and who's standing up and fighting for us? Because what was said a little earlier when we talked about deportations and Judy had a good comment. Now, if Obama had raids and now we're looking at there's raids happening now, what changed? In is it possibly the rhetoric around those raids? That's my point. The rhetoric is what has changed, but you had one candidate that campaigned on hope, one candidate that campaigned on pulling everybody together, but then when he was in office, the raids happened. You had one candidate that has a totally different, more aggressive approach and does the exact same thing. No, he didn't. No, no, it's actually not the same thing. What's it? I, I have to. We have okay, to. Okay, okay. Well, let's let's that, say this. Actually. Let's let's it's let's not do exactly this. Exactly Day thing. forty. We're we're day thirty six. We're day thirty six. So let's look at just a purely the numbers. At this point. When you look at presidencies, the number of people that were deported under prior administration is more or less than its predecessor. More. 
No, no wait, I'm, I'm saying it that more or less than his predecessor, who was a Republican. More. So, so I let me tell you, I've represented some guys who were deported off of fishing without a license because they were fishing on the banks of a lake with their son. And they were deported for fishing without a license. This was 2010, and I was their lawyer in court and watched them have to go to ICE's, get processed by ICE, and ultimately get deported. I live in a community, and I represent a community that was 50% undocumented. I've seen more families torn apart in the last 15 years than you probably ever really want to worry or see. So we get too caught up sometimes with our rah-rah for my team, because I want my team to win, because I'm this team and they're that team. But the reality is, it's been happening, and too many people have been silent as you're being right now when it was going on the last 10 years. I, I, it, so you can raise your voice now, but you can't just stop when your team's got the ball. You know what, Ashley, though, I think I want to ask, I, wanna, I want you to answer the question that was asked, which is, how do you... What's the antidote to the very real fear that a lot of people are experiencing right now because of some of the rhetoric that came out of the campaign, because of some of the policies that have been enacted by the administration, and because of the divide that we see in this nation, which is much greater than we've seen in a very long time? You know, there's, uh, if, I, if I said there was a, a quick fix, I would just say, um, you know, let's just watch Saturday Night Live every Saturday and, and just hope that, that, that we can all laugh at what's going on. But the reality is that this is um, a completely different place and time we live in right now. Um, this history will look back and they will have to judge this administration as harshly or as graciously as they have every other administration. If I could say to you that there was an antidote to make you feel better about everything that you saw on TV, I would tell you. But there isn't. And here's why. Because what happened this 2016 was a completely changing of the guard. There are people and policies and practices in place that are new for everyone. There's not anyone who can look and say that they know exactly what's about to happen next. I can't even tell you that. But what I can tell you is that if you truly believe that what happens next is important to you, then you have to not, you, you cannot be on the sidelines in the sense of just saying, I'm upset, okay? Because that's too easy, and that's actually copping out. If you're really upset about what you see, then you need to be a part of the solution, and how that is, the, and what that means is that there is a checks and balances, thank God, in our Constitution, right? That, they, that the president is checked by, the, by, by Congress, Congress checked by, Supreme Court, if you don't know your member of Congress, if you have not talked to your member of Congress and you have not told them what you're specifically upset about, not that you're just mad, but I mean specifically, how can it then, you know, I'll do this last example. If you look at our friend in California, Dianne Feinstein, she says, well, you know, I'm going to vote for this guy because nobody called my office and told me they didn't want him in there. She got a whole bunch of calls. She got a whole bunch of calls after that. That is my point. People are quiet. If you have a role to play, there is your role. It's no more genuine uh, ambition in this country. Being a part of it, being American means you have to voice your grievances with specificity. Just saying you're upset is not enough to get anything changed. Thank you very much. This was a film that was meant to spark discussion. So we hope that this discussion around the film and around what you saw and heard in this film will continue outside of the theater. And Sylvie has some words for us before we say goodbye. James Baldwin said, nothing can be changed until it is faced. So I wanted to thank you, Judy, Michelle, Ashley, uh, and all of you here tonight for facing a difficult issue and helping us get closer to the truth. Uh, there's more stories uh, about, about the fight for freedom rights. Uh, Judy Richardson has a book, Hands on the Freedom Plow. Yes, the unsung heroes. And there's information about this book in the foyer. And we've just been so delighted to have you here today and with our Society of Fellows in, in the Symposium on Civil Rights the past three days. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much.